That's, that's right. So what I'll talk about today is, is applications, so things that we've been doing or I've been doing and the people in my group have been doing. So I, I really ought to say that just as in particularly the first lecture and this lecture are both very much a personal point of view and there's a lot of emotion that surrounds the creation of not only classical interatomic potentials, also density functional theory, but in a way somehow tight binding seems to generate a huge amount of heat and friction. So you have to understand that this, this really is a, a personal point of view and if you heard lectures from other people in the field you might hear things um, explained or, or, or emphasized very, very differently. But before I absolutely start, I'd like to just say something in acknowledgement of my co-workers in this. So again, on a historic note, it was exactly 20 years ago that four of us started what we called the Atomistic Simulation Center at Queen's University Belfast. That was Ruth Lyndon Bell, Mike Finnis, Ali Alavi, and me. And we built the group and all of us have left uh, Ruth retired, Mike and I moved to London, Ali moved to Cambridge and now he's gone to the Max Planck Institute in, in Stuttgart and Jorge Cohenhoff is now running the group and it's just as active and, uh, and alive as it was before with many new people and a few weeks ago we had the 20th anniversary um, celebration so we, which Jorge organized so I'll start by showing this is us on the steps of the Titanic at the new Titanic Centre in, uh, in, in Belfast, in, in the Queen's Island. So I can just quickly point out some of the people who, who have been working in this problem with us. There's Ali, by the way. There's Ruth. I'm afraid she's hidden by... That's my son. That's my youngest boy, Alfie. His ha hand is in front of Ruth's face. That's my daughter's... No, it's not my daughter, Zoe. I thought it was. My daughter's somewhere there. Uh, that's Mike Finnis. Uh, there's Jorge Kohenhoff, there's me of course, and uh, Demita Pashov, who now works with me in London, he moved with me to London, and also uh, Ivailo Katsarov, who moved with me to London. He's been doing the, the quantum work, the work on the quantum protons uh, that's very much related to what Michaela does here. Um, Chavdar Todorov here with his little son Orlean who invented the time dependent type binding amongst many other things. Uh, there's um, Alan Eleanor who did the time dependent simulations that I showed you the other day and I think that's everybody. I've left out Terence Shepard but then he wasn't there um, but he was a great contributor to the work I'm going to talk about today. So in lecture two I, I first need to tell you about finding parameters that's the particularly contentious part of it so we have a theory and there are some disposable parameters so where do we get them from and um, then the, the examples are quite wide-ranging in my recent research uh, water and uh, titanium dioxide and then um, my principal interest uh, that goes right back to my background as a, as a metallurgist all those years ago in Sheffield is really in iron and I sometimes claim these days that by simulating carbon in iron which has really only happened in every group in the, around the world in the last few years we can finally say that we really are studying steel properly because it's that that distinguishes iron from steel it's the presence of carbon so how do we find parameters and there are many approaches but there are groups around the world, and there's nothing wrong with them, who believe that if you have a tight binding model, then you can calculate its parameters ab initio. It's practically as if God has given them to us. Um, and it's not the point of view that I take. I prefer a glorious fitting scheme. I think that on the whole, the parameters, one point is that the model should be totally insensitive, or almost insensitive to the choice of parameters. It shouldn't be one of these things that just goes wrong when you change one parameter. It really shouldn't matter. As long as they're within the intuitive range that you expect, you should get a good model. So you can get a long way just by guessing the parameters, guessing how they depend on distance. You can appeal to the canonical band theory. And then you can finish off uh, with some fitting. And as uh, Albert Einstein said, as simple as possible, but no simply. We don't want to build some complicated house of cards that collapses the moment that you pull out uh, one of the cards from the base. So um, this is a complicated slide. I don't want to, to ask me exactly how it works, but what we're doing in my own work is a, is a program that we got from a chap called uh, Hans Paul Schwefel, who wrote it in the end of the 1970s, it's a genetic algorithm. So the, the idea would be that there's a number of properties of your system that you'd like your model to be able to predict. So you write a little Python script that, given a set of parameters, calculates what these properties are. They could be 
energy differences between structures, elastic constants, lattice constants, anything really, even surface energies, chemical reactions, I mean phase diagrams if you have enough computer time and then you simply continue to calculate these things, properties with, with, with varying sets of parameters and the genetic algorithm finds the set of parameters for you that, that, that optimizes um, uh, the comparison of the predicted results with your targets. So if I just remind you from the last lecture, what we really have at the heart of the tight binding model are these, are these bond integrals, the sigma, the pi, and the delta bond integrals between sp and d orbitals. So when I have two atoms, I have to decide which orbitals I want to use, depending on uh, where these atoms appear in the periodic table, what I think are the important orbitals. But very importantly, these hopping integrals have to depend on the distance between the atoms. So what we call the scaling, the distance scaling of the hopping integrals has to be established. And we'd like to use the simplest possible forms. In most of the work I do on metals, I just say that any Hamiltonian matrix element just scales exponentially with distance. The same with the overlap matrix elements. Here's a nice simple pair potential for the pair part of the total energy. Um, we do use more complicated forms at times. This is, the, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a form which has a rather natural cutoff to it, which was uh, um, proposed by these authors. Sometimes we even use Chaddy's old quadratic method, but whatever we use for the, for the functional forms, we're always careful at the end, at the long distances, to cut them off properly and differentiably to zero, so that we don't have problems of any energy conservation in molecular dynamics. So however these things scale, even exponential scaling isn't really fast enough um, at, at the far tail. So there's always a little bit of work that has to go in um, to, to, to adding additional cutoff tails. And then you get some sort of graph like this, this is for my work on iron and hydrogen in iron. So the various hopping integrals, the dots, dotted lines of the overlaps matrix elements, the solid lines, the Hamiltonian matrix elements, except for this dotted line, this fat one, the three black ones are the three standard canonical dd sigma, dd pi, and dd delta which are all you really need for a pure model of iron. But we argued that when hydrogen's involved, it's essential, unfortunately, also to um, employ S electrons on the iron atoms. And they're rather longer range, generally speaking. So here's the SS sigma, much, much longer range than the, than the D integrals. And uh, this, this is a graph of a, of a pair potential. These are the pair potentials we're using for the calculations in, in iron. It even goes negative slightly. You saw the... Um, the pair potential I showed you a moment ago had a positive part and a negative part, and somewhere around the first neighbors and second neighbors, it, it's actually necessary to make the pair potential very slightly negative. So it's not uh, an absolutely repulsive pairwise term in the, in the theory. And we claimed here in this recent paper that we have a set of, this was the work of um, Terence Shepard, and it was a gigantic piece of work, and it's something which not, it, it's a rare student who's willing to take on a problem like this, and the enormous frustrations and the failures and the, and the, and the despair that comes to you when you try to build up a tight binding model, that is almost like building a house of cards, because what we wanted was a set of hopping integrals that were universal in the sense that they would describe, in our case, we wanted to describe water, and we wanted to describe or, um, organic molecules, certain small organic molecules. And later on, we even wanted to describe transition metal surfaces, and I'll show you uh, some results. Transition metal oxide surfaces, and I'll show you some results of those. So in the case of water, I started thinking about water 10, 15 years ago, thinking that having invented this polarizable iron method that we applied for zirconium dioxide in transition metal oxides, I thought, well, why doesn't water behave a bit similarly? In point of fact, if you look at the bond length, the oxygen-oxygen um, the bond length in water, in liquid water, it's pretty much the same as the distance between oxygen atoms in a transition metal oxide in fluorite. So um, it's not that different. So the way we started thinking about water was like this. If we only, uh, you remember I talked last time about point charges and, and, and dipole and quadrupole moments on the atoms. If we, only, if we only had a point charge model at the level of point charges, we would argue somewhat like this, that we have an oxygen atom and two hydrogens, there's a bond angle theta and a bond length d, and, 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 and you know from your chemistry that the oxygen has a formal charge of two minus, it formally takes away an entire electron from and leaves a bare proton. So we have a, we have a, a that's not really true, but some fraction of an electron delta is stripped off the hydrogen atom and, and acquired by the oxygen atom. So we now have a system which is charged and so um, there's a dipole moment. 
Uh, and you can calculate the dipole moment just from geometry. But it's just a function of the amount of charge delta. So we have this Hubbard U. We can tune, we can turn this big Hubbard U knob, um, which is one of our parameters, in order to um, obtain a certain charge transfer, if you like. And so the dipole moment that's generated by these three point charges is, is simply given by this formula in electrostatics. And it depends on the, on the, on the quantity delta. So if we know what the target dipole moment is, it's actually in, in water molecule 1.86 Debye, then we can simply tune our U in a point charge model, it's as simple as that, to produce, an to produce a water molecule. And that's the, that's the data on the first line here, some, um, some results of simulations just on a single water molecule. But if you're thinking about going beyond the point charge model, say to the dipole level, then the, uh, the charges on the two hydrogen atoms induce an electric field at the oxygen nucleus. And that electric field will act to polarize the, uh, the oxygen atom. So you might say that there's an induced dipole moment. It points in the opposite direction. That's this blue thing. And it's simply the polarizability of the oxygen anion times the electric field, which is this. Now, the polarizability of the oxygen anion may well depend on delta because it may depend on its charge state. So the oxygen 2 plus, 2 minus ion will have a different polarizability than, say, the oxygen 1 minus. So this would be a sort of self-consistent formula. Now, if I compare these two formulas, I can see that I, from, I can replace the electric field by terms in this P of delta. So I get that the ratio of the induced dipole to the point charge dipole is given by that. And so if we knew the polarizability of the oxygen anion, Atom as a function of its charge, uh, then we'd have a closed set of equations that we could solve and we could then, we'd then have a model. Um, we know that the experimental dipole moment must be the sum of the two and uh, unfortunately this didn't work. I had a, a clever student who thought about this and said, well, let's look at the polarizability of, uh, of atoms in the first row as a function of the number of electrons. We should be able to predict um, she just fitted it to a straight line, and so we should be able to predict what the polarizability of the anion is. Unfortunately, that doesn't work, so we have to take that as a fitting parameter in two cases. So 0.7 doesn't work, 0.31 is necessary. So we have the parameter delta, or the U, and we have the polarizability, and then we have a dipole model for water. And we were very happy because, it, you know, one can reproduce even the force constants, which is a subtle problem. We can, in, we can reproduce the polarizability of the entire molecule and even its binding energy. So that's where we were. It was a sort of a bottom-up creation of a model for water, starting with the, di with the monomer and then we went on to the dimer. But I'm going to jump a few years because this is what we originally published and now uh, we had uh, Sasha Lozovoy, the postdoc, working on it for three, or three years or so. And, uh, and so to, to, to think about the water dimer, there are two possible, well, there's many, but there are two competing geometries. Uh, this is fairly well known. This is the famous hydrogen bond where there's an oxygen-oxygen bond with a, a proton sort of practically stuck inside it. Uh, laid off by a little angle alpha. Well, you could imagine that these, because these things ha have little electric dipoles, that this thing has a down dipole, that has an up dipole. You'd think that they were just a line like that. That would be a naive electrostatic point of view. In fact, they do. That is the structure of the molecule at very short distances, as we know from coupled cluster um, uh, uh, quantum chemistry calculations. But our tight binding model also reproduces that. So here's the energy versus bond length oxygen oxygen bond length um, in the case that it's in this configuration and here's the energy uh, versus bond length in the case that it's in the standard hydrogen bond configuration and there is indeed a crossover and these are the couple cluster results so it's very consistent with that so we had to do further work in fitting the oxygen oxygen hopping and the uh, and the pair terms in order to get a reproduction of this um, of this result and we were able to look, for example, at hydrogen transferring. So we start with two water molecules in the ordinary sense in a, in a water dimer, and we grab one of the protons. In real life, they're not exactly in a straight line. As I said, there's this angle alpha, which it lays off. It's called a nonlinear hydrogen bond. And we just drag this thing uh, from one side of the system to the other. So we end up with an OH minus and an H3O plus. And the energy to do that um, calculated in the tight binding model looks like that and it compares not bad I, we're quite happy with that compared to a, a, a couple cluster single double triple calculation in quantum chemistry um, this was the disaster this is the thing that went wrong in the 2011 paper we claimed that we 
correctly predicted the static dielectric constant of water, but we don't. We're out by a factor of about a half. We understand why that is now. We should never have claimed it in the first place. After all, it's a minimal basis set. There are no polarization orbitals and so on. It's just an SP basis set. So, so, the, so we, um, the experimental dielectric constant is here as a function of temperature, and these are our values. So we get the, the trends in the temperature dependence right, but uh, we will have to do some more work if we really wanted to have a model of water uh, with the correct dielectric constant. But what does come out incredibly well, and this was very gratifying, is the self diffusivity, the self-diffusion coefficient of water as a function of temperature. So these are our calculations, these black triangles, and, and, and they are compared with um, experimental data. So that's extremely gratifying that, that none of this is fitted now, you see. We're only really fitting um, uh, in the early stages. So everything I'm going to show you now are, are basically predictions of the model to show how good it is. Um, this is the band gap. People don't often publish or, or calculate the band gap of liquid water, but we've done it here as a function of temperature. These are our data here. There's one experimental point that we could find. It, it, it's probably the, you know, the, the, the coincidence is too good. And anyway, what the hell do you mean by band gap? So at any rate, it's a trend. Uh, and we have the band gap of the, of the monomer. The, but the point is that the band gap of the monomer is much larger than the band gap of, of the liquid. That's interesting. The band gap of the liquid gets smaller with temperature. Uh, and here's the band gap of ice as a function of temperature, all calculated within our model and compared with um, one experimental data point. Uh, this is the coordination number, the famous fifth neighbor. Here's the, an experimental data point of the coordination number of, of liquid water as a function of temperature. And you can see it kind of heads down and becomes less coordinated. Uh, and this is the value for ice, exactly four. So this is the number of hydrogen bonds per um, or twice the number of hydrogen bonds per water molecule. So in a, in a, in a perfect um, uh, network, in a perfect covalent network like that, every water molecule has four neighbors. But in liquid water, uh, that's not the case. And that appears to increase uh, with temperature, as we found in our calculations. And this is the final and, and, and more elusive one, because we didn't have quite enough computer time to finish it off. But it's, of course, very tantalizing to see if we can, if we can predict the, uh, uh, the density maximum of water uh, close, to the, close to the freezing temperature. And, and our data points are sort of tantalizingly close to, 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 the, uh, to the possibility that our model does indeed um, have something to say about the density maximum of water, the fact that water um, has a density maximum around about its melting temperature. Here's just a table from the paper. Um, the only point I want to make from this is that our ice floats on water. So our liquid is more dense than our ice, which is not necessarily the case. In, in, and we tried to get as many data as we could from, um, from density functional type calculations. And very frequently, density functional ice sinks in water, which is a shame. So finally, in that, in that trend, in that series of three papers, the first paper actually was on organic molecules, the second paper was on water, and the third paper was on titanium dioxide. Now, this isn't particularly useful because we haven't got any experimental comparison for you. But if you want to know how good we are at reproducing um, vibrational properties of molecules, this was, again, this gigantic work of the student Terence Shepard. Um, you can look in the paper and see there are huge tables which are too big to fit on a screen. But you can see we did a great deal of analysis analysis of, uh, of vibrational frequencies of quite complicated uh, organic molecules. Um, and here's, here's a movie. So um, this puts the first, those first two items together, the notion that we have water and we have benzyl acetone. And what we're going to do in the movie is attempt to hydrogenate this. This is a C double OH, uh, sorry, a C double bond O group, CO with a double bond, and there's here an H3O plus, there's an extra proton in the water, and when I run the movie you'll see that by the Grotus mechanism the proton will jump to one or two water molecules until it finds the C double bond O and will attach itself to become a COH group. So we were sort of able to explicitly demonstrate this kind of chemical reaction by molecular dynamics. So I've, we just colored that blue so you can see which is the hydronium ion. There's the proton, now that's the hydronium ion. And then it jumps, and very quickly now it's going to uh, attach itself to the benzyl acetone. There it goes. 
and it's done it. It jumped quickly to that molecule and then it ended up and now those of you who have a degree in chemistry will know that this is called an enolization reaction. I have to admit I didn't know that. Right, now wouldn't it be marvellous if we could also study water and a transition metal oxide simultaneously using the same model. So um, again, this was Sasha Lozovoy's work. He, uh, he, he did some work to develop a tight binding model for titanium dioxide. This is a big uh, nanocrystal of anatase and the atom positions were relaxed and compared with the density functional calculation that somebody sent us. This is the dipole moment of the molecule. There are two arrows here. You can hardly see that there are two uh, because the dipole moment from the tight binding calculations is identical to that from the density functional calculations. And now here is another movie. So this is, a, this is a little nanocrystal of anatase with water molecules um, absorbed on it and migrating around the surface. And from a technical point of view, I want to make this point very strongly that we've colored the water molecules with a slightly deeper blue, just so you can see that they're water molecules. But in the theory, they are the same. These are the same, uh, they're the same species in, in, in the theory. They have the same hopping integrals, the same, um, all the same um, type binding parameters as the oxygen atoms do in here. So there's no embarrassment like you might have in a classical potential if a water molecule decides to dissociate and the oxygen decides to join uh, uh, and become part of the oxide. That's not a problem. It can do that because the whole thing is what you might call a transferable uh, model in that sense. Nothing else happens, you just see the, uh, the water molecules dancing around on the surface. And the last thing that we wanted to ask, does water actually ever dissociate on titanium dioxide? And I don't think we have an answer to that. I don't know that, I think there's still enormous disputes going on when you, you read more and more papers. But we did manage to see one example of that. So just for fun, we can show you a simulation in which the water molecule dissociates. And that's why it's important that we don't have different parameters uh, for oxygen if it's in water than if we have parameters for oxygen if it's part of benzyl acetone or if it's part of a, of a titanium dioxide surface. So that concludes that part of the presentation related to <coughs> our work in, uh, in, in liquid systems and on, uh, and on transition metal surfaces. So for the rest of the talk, I want to talk about my own work. Well, it's all my, you know, my own particular um, interest, which is, it, which is in iron. And as I told you in the last lecture, we, um, we developed um, a magnetic type binding theory which we then were able to implement and I described that in the last lecture. So these are energy bands so if only d electrons are used uh, then one sees a set of d bands this is the uh, the majority and the minority spin channels and in the case of uh, putting in an additional S electron into the type binding model, you can see the typical transition metal feature of an S band, which, which is free electron-like, cosine-like, um, but as it crosses, it hybridizes and mixes with the D bands to produce uh, a mixture of D and, 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 and S-like bands, and then at high energies, it reappears as a free electron band again up above the transition metal. Here's the Fermi level, and so this is the majority, and these are the minority spin channels. These are, this is the best type binding model that I could make. These are the uh, density functional bands in the local spin density approximation. <coughs> So um, this is rather technical. I made four models. It doesn't really matter. Let's just look at one of them. So look at the SD fixed one. This is the model. Look at this one because there's more data. So using S and D electrons or using only D electrons, um, we, these aren't always predictions because many of these are fitted. We have the bulk modulus, the, the two shear constants, uh, the difference in energy between HCP and BCC, um, the vacancy formation energy. Now, you, you may not believe this, but there's a huge dispute in the experimental literature as to what actually is the vacancy formation energy. It might be as big as two electron volts, 
According to Alfred Zeger, it can't possibly be bigger than 1.85 electron volts. So if you belong to the Stuttgart School of, Think school of Thinking, uh, then uh, this is your vacancy formation energy. If you belong to the Scandinavian school, so-called, these are all measurements that are done using um, positron annihilation and muon spin rotation experiments, uh, then you, 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 your experimental data agree with the local spin density approximation. But if you agree with Zeger, and he's very, very scathing, if you read any of his papers, he, he can be bitterly critical of the density functional theory and all of its works. And he believes that they've simply made a mistake in calculating the vacancy. Something as simple as a vacancy formation energy in a pure metal is, 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 is quite an elusive quantity. Here's the migration energy of a vacancy calculated, and here are three surface energies that we've calculated. So that was pure iron. The principle that I try to work on is that if I now want to make a model for hydrogen in iron, I don't go messing with the, with the iron parameters. They're fixed. We have a model for iron, and I want to use it, and I don't want to change it because of the embarrassment of hydrogen not working. So we live with the parameters that we have for, for iron, and we simply seek now some hopping integrals for the s electron on the hydrogen to the, to the to the d and s orbitals on the, on, on the iron atoms and some pair potentials. And, and I actually worked with just, f just five quantities to fit to. So I considered these fictional FEH or fictitious FEH uh, crystals uh, of hydrogen in iron. And using the density functional calculations, I, I calculated energy volume curves for these. And there are four possible because you could use FCC iron or BCC iron, and you can put um, the hydrogen into either octahedral or tetrahedral sites. In the FCC case, when you put the hydrogen, if you put atoms into the, into the tetrahedral sites, you create the um, zinc blend structure. And in the FCC case, if you put atoms into the octahedral sites at that stoichiometry, you create the rock salt structure. That's just an interesting point. So these are the type binding results using the genetic algorithm fitted to those uh, five data points, namely the, the minimum, the energy differences, and, and, and the atomic volumes. And, this, and these are the magnetic moments uh, as a function of volume compared to the local spin density approximation. Just to remind you, this is the slide I showed a moment ago. These are the hopping integrals that were obtained, and the pair, you see the hydrogen, carb, hydrogen ion pair potential is this blue line down here. And these are the energy bands. So again, in the uh, majority and minority spin channels, these are the tight binding bands. These are the bands in the local spin density approximation. Again, the energy band, same sort of thing. But now, instead of a, the, the interesting thing is that if you remember the iron, pure iron bands, there was an S, an iron S band, which rose as a free electron band and hybridized and mixed with the D bands. When hydrogen is put onto the lattice, there's an orthogonality between the iron S and the hydrogen S. The iron S are pushed way up out of the picture. They're up above the Fermi level somewhere. So the iron S bands have disappeared. And now we have the hydrogen S bands down here, split off by a large band gap from the, from the D bands of the, of the transition metal. Now, Christian Elsesser, who I was working with on this problem, had done previously some calculations, what he called adiabatic surfaces. So he kept a rigid lattice of FCC or BCC iron, and then he took the sublattice of hydrogen atoms in these FEH stoichiometries, and he moved them uh, in various crystallographic directions and mapped out the total energy. And that's very important because it gives you uh, the, the starting point for thinking about, uh, about hydrogen movement in iron and what the energy barriers might look like. So the most important one is because hydrogen occupies the tetrahedral sites in the BCC iron. These are the octahedral sites here. These are the iron atoms. And so you're particularly interested in this minimum, in this path, it might be the minimum energy path for this hydrogen atom. It goes through a saddle point and ends up in the neighboring tetrahedral site. That was this line I've drawn here in red. In point of fact, it doesn't quite go through the saddle point. As you can see, there's a the minimum energy is slightly away from the saddle point. It actually takes a slightly curved path uh, like that.
and not, without any kind of fitting at all, um, the agreement with the, uh, with the density functional is extremely good. So it, 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 it worked very well from that point of view. Um, hydrogen on the surface of iron was, 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 is less good, so I, I, won't, I won't dwell on it. I'll just leave that slide on, on the record. It's in, it's in the paper, but the question was where does hydrogen and what's the absorption energy for hydrogen uh, on the surface? And, and uh, it, it, there isn't particularly good agreement, as you can see, with, with, with density. GGA is, is generalized gradient approximation. It's a flavor of density functional theory, local spin density approximation. So having made a, what we think is a fairly plausible model for hydrogen iron, we were interested in hydrogen diffusion. So let me show you this first, because the reason I'm here, apart from uh, giving a couple of lectures, is to work with, with Michele here with his beautiful um, ring polymer molecular dynamics. And, you know, it's a, a tribute to his enormous skill that in a matter of a day and a half, we've actually got ring polymer molecular dynamics working uh, in the type binding code. And we did a movie, which we finished this morning, and this is now, uh, these are the little ring polymer beads um, vibrating in, in, in an iron lattice. So this is, a, uh, this is a fully quantum mechanical calculation. Not only the electrons are quantum mechanical through the type binding parameterization, but also the ions are quantum mechanical through the, through the uh, Feynman path integral formalism. So the atoms, each atom for is, is actually a little necklace. So there's only one hydrogen atom, there's only one proton, um, but here it's being represented as a, as a set of replicas to represent its, uh, its partition function. But before we did that, before I came, we were thinking in a, in a different way about how to calculate the, um, the diffusivity of hydrogen in iron. And we did it in this way, rightly or wrongly, it's an ansatz at any rate. So the question is, what do you do about relaxing the atoms? Um, do the iron atoms move when the hydrogen atom moves, et cetera, et cetera? So what we did was, well, Eva, this is now Evilo's work. I showed you him a moment ago in the, in the photograph, is he would take a, a reasonably large supercell, 16 atoms of, uh, of iron, and he'd put a, a hydrogen atom into a tetrahedral site, and he'd relax the iron atoms around that. So it's sitting in a, in a relaxed um, uh, configuration. And then he would leave those iron atoms fixed and he would simply explore the energy surface by moving the hydrogen atom around and calculating the total energy to produce, um, uh, to produce in this case, it's a three-dimensional energy map, but this is a contour plot of a section through it. So that we put to one side and we keep that for your further use. And then we take the hydrogen atom and we move it to the saddle point. As I showed you, the saddle point in that uh, adiabatic surface, the, the halfway position between the, the two um, tetrahedral sites. So he holds it in that position and then again he, relax, he relaxes the atoms around that, keeping the, the hydrogen at the saddle point and then moving the hydrogen atom around in that fixed energy landscape you get a um, in, that, in those fixed iron atoms, you get an energy landscape looking like this. And we base everything on these two energy landscapes. We then try to do a, something as best we can um, in the nature of a quantum transition state theory. So we do that with Feynman's path integral, which I'm sure you've heard about through uh, and explained much better than I can through Michaela's work. But as Feynman pointed out, uh, the partition function of a, of a quantum, this is just for one single particle moving in one dimension, the, the, the partition function of a quantum particle actually maps onto a, a classical partition function of a, of a necklace of, of masses connected by, by linear springs. And these are the spring stiffnesses. And they see the potential uh, at the particular point where the bead is. So in that movie I showed you a moment ago, each of those little images was sampling a slightly different, um, slightly different potential energy because it was slightly differently placed with respect to the iron atoms, and that's captured in here. So Evo calculates the partition function using something called wang landau Monte Carlo sampling, and when you have the partition function, you can calculate the particle probability density uh, and the free energy. And from that, you can use uh, transition state theory to calculate the diffusivity. And it's quite interesting to look at the position probability density of hydrogen uh, at a lattice site as a function of temperature. So you can see that it, you know, it's not really a point particle. Even at quite modest temperatures, it's spread out. And it's not at all spherical at very low temperatures, but it has a real shape to it. And if you then 
take the particle and put it at the saddle point and recalculate the position and probability density, something quite interesting happens at low temperatures. The proton splits into two and it occupies equally the two equilibrium sites. So though we've constrained uh, the centroid of the, of the necklace to be at the saddle point, which is here, there's very little probability density for the proton to be actually found there at the very low temperatures. Uh, whereas at higher temperatures, still the particle is very much spread out, but at least it remains where it's supposed to be, which is at the saddle point. And to cut a long story short, we calculated um, using Gregory Voth's um, theory in this particular case, the diffusivity. So this, if you like, is an ab initio calculation of the diffusivity of hydrogen in iron. It's slightly banana shaped. It's not um, completely Arrhenius-like. And uh, we're, we're very gratified that the comparison with, uh, with experimental data is very good. The centroid MD, these are calculations similar to the ones that I'm now learning how to do here, but done by uh, a, a group, uh, not us, um, using a classical interatomic potential. So it'd be interesting for us now to explore uh, the low temperature region and to explore the discrepancies, say, between these two points, which we can do now that we, uh, uh, thanks to you, we have the, um, the MD ourselves. People are extremely interested in the... Um, in the technical world in hydrogen trapped by a vacancy in BCC iron. It's known that a, a vacancy can trap up to six hydrogen atoms and um, there's something which uh, people call the superabundance of vacancies. It's very closely related to the hydrogen embrittlement problem in steel. Uh, the, the notion that hydrogen can create vacancies by a surfactant effect or what uh, Kirchheim calls a defactant effect by lowering the free energy of a vacancy through, through absorption. So we're particularly interested in this, in this problem and in the trapping of a hydrogen atom uh, by a vacancy. So for example, uh, using the nudged elastic band method I was able to calculate, here's just a movie showing the process of a hydrogen atom starting out outside, there's a vacancy, this atom is, is in the background, this is a cube of atoms with, a, uh, with a, an atom, an iron atom missing and here the hydrogen atom is jumping into the nearest uh, site close to the vacancy and whereas this is the minimum energy path for bulk diffusion, this is the minimum energy path for that process so the hydrogen is trapped in a well of about 0.2 electron volts in potential energy deep and we're interested in calculating the, uh, the rate of that process, which we did. I'll only go over this very short. I showed this in, in Marseille when I was at that conference where Michaela was at. But we were able to calculate the rate coefficient uh, um, as a function of temperature for, for bulk diffusivity, for trapping by a vacancy, and for escape from a vacancy. And to show that um, by, by, by plotting the, 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 the square root mass weighted rate coefficient, uh, the curves should all fall onto the same line if there were no, if there were, if, 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 if the mass was entering simply classically into the problem. So it's very clear there are very, very marked non-classical effects. And to find a really light object, we decided just for fun to, to look at the muon. But of course, the poor old muon doesn't live long enough to, uh, to diffuse very far in iron. So that's a theoretical playground. So I can come now to carbon in iron. I have to say this was a great deal more difficult. I won't go into the technical details, but I tried to do exactly the same thing to make the four phases, the four fictional phases FEC this time, with density functional theory to calculate energy volume curves and try to fit them um, to the tight binding. What's um, particularly striking, if you like, is the fact in the FCC structure that the that carbon occupying the tetrahedral sites, even though the tetrahedral site in the FCC structure is very much smaller than the octahedral site in the FCC structure, nevertheless marginally by expanding the lattice going to a larger atomic volume, the carbon prefers the tetrahedral sites, even though it could sit in the octahedral sites where there is a great deal more space. So what it means is that the zinc blend structure in FEC has a lower energy than the rock salt structure. And that was extremely difficult to fit in the tight binding just because, you know, it's a counterintuitive size effect. And probably the reason is that its environment, the carbon environment in the tetrahedral site is, is tetrahedral. It has four neighbors, which carbon likes. Uh, rather than six neighbours, which it has otherwise. And so 
if you wanted to make a classical potential for this, you'd be really hard pressed to do so because there's no notion of, 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 of hybridization and hybrid orbitals and so on in a, in, in a, in, in a classical potential. It's a purely quantum mechanical notion uh, that you can create sp3 hybrids out of your orbitals so that the bonds can point uh, along to, uh, from the center to the, to the four corners of a tetrahedron. But it was a struggle to get this right. And what was extremely gratifying then was going to the slightly more dilute limit is that we calculated a number of phases, Fe2c, Fe3c, Fe4c, and compared with uh, density functional calculations. But what's particularly important, some things, these things go rather wrong. These are substitutional phases which are unlikely to occur, uh, but type binding doesn't do a very good job of those. Uh, the only really important part of this is, is the calculation of the theta and epsilon Fe3c phases, which are the most important phases in metallic. This theta Fe3c is called cementite, and that's a ubiquitous phase in steel. And epsilon ion carbide is a particularly interesting, um, slightly higher free energy phase, um, which, which is of great importance in modern ultra high strength steels. And it, it appears at the very, very early stages of tempering of high strength steels. And it serves actually, interestingly enough, to increase the hardness as a function of tempering time um, at certain tem at low, low temperatures, so 200 degrees centigrade tempering. So we're, my, my experimental colleagues and I are particularly interested in this phase, and so it is gratifying that the type binding uh, model seems to be faithfully uh, reproducing some of those properties. If you go right into the dilute limit, the, the um, Carbon is rather strange. It occupies in FCC iron, it occupies the uh, tetrahedral sites at the concentrated limit, but the octahedral sites in the dilute limit, and it distorts the octahedron um, in the process producing a tetragonal structure. And here I've calculated the migration energy of carbon in alpha iron, the migration energy of carbon in gamma iron, in austenite, and there are two ways in which you can do it. It can so I have two examples here. It can go first to the tetrahedral site and then back to the neighboring octahedral site in a double jump. You might think it would do that. That would seem to be the natural thing to do. But according to density functional theory, or also according to tight binding, a lower energy path is strangely enough obtained by simply bursting straight through uh, the nearest neighbor iron bond from one octahedral site to the next. These are very interesting. This is now the binding of one and two carbon atoms to a vacancy in, in iron. And this was very problematic for me, particularly the fact that the two, two, iron, two carbon atoms bind very strongly in, a, in, a, in an iron vacancy. And I, don't, I think there's not time to go through all of this. We wrote a paper about it, and you can, you can read about it. But here's, the vacant, here's a, a cube of iron atoms in the BCC structure with an atom missing there, which is the vacant site. And I can place two carbon atoms on opposite octahedral sites and ask what will they do? Well, they might move together like this. The fact is that they do form a bond, a carbon-carbon bond, uh, which is almost the same, exactly the same length as the bond of carbon in, in graphite or in diamond. Um, but the, the structure that they actually prefer, both in density functional theory and in tight binding, is this rather odd off-center 001 orientation. And the reason is that the carbon atom now has three iron atoms and one carbon atom as a neighbor. So again, the carbon atom has achieved its goal of having four neighbors. It's a bit like, like ethane, isn't it? Except instead of being hydrogen, these bonds are all the same length. Uh, you have iron atoms. And this is just a table showing, and again, the type binding isn't perfect, but it shows the exothermic binding of both hydrogen and carbon uh, to a vacancy um, in, in, in iron. And uh, in DFT, you can bind six, six hydrogen atoms, but you can't put a seventh right in the vacant site itself. Unfortunately, you can in the type binding, so this is a mistake. Um, the type binding can't quite reproduce that important property. So can I just finish off um, with hydrogen in epsilon iron carbide? Epsilon iron carbide is a very simple structure. It's HCP iron, so you've got A, B, A, sorry, yeah, A, B, A, B, close packed lay layers of, 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 of iron atoms, and then the hydrogen, uh, then the carbons, I'm sorry, the carbons occupy octahedral sites of the HCP structure. And that's, that's Fe3C, 
and I've put a, a hydrogen in one of the octahedral sites or I've put a hydrogen in one of the tetrahedral sites and I was interested in um, minimum energy paths for diffusion because what's extremely important is whether carbides like these, titanium carbide, vanadium, niobium carbide can act as sponges to soak up uh, the malignant hydrogen in a high strength steel. Now the movies are not good here because I didn't quite but you may just be able to see what I've got here which is a a hydrogen atom migrating from an octahedral site to a tetrahedral site and here I've calculated the minimum energy path. The point being that the energy barriers are not hugely high, they're certainly smaller than what we found in the other transition metal carbides. So it looks like it's a, a promising candidate um, uh, for a hydrogen sponge if you like. Here I've got a little uh, sort of double hop so the the hydrogen atom is, is, is migrating first within the carbon, within the iron layer from one octahedral site to the next and now it's migrating through the iron to a neighbouring layer into a neighbouring octahedral site and oddly enough even though it has to force its way through um, a plane of iron atoms the energy barrier is a, is a little bit lower. And I think finally I've got the hydrogen atom migrating from an octahedral site to a tetrahedral site and back to an octahedral site again in the case where I have a carbon vacancy. So it started out in a site which was a vacancy so I'd actually made a non-stoichiometric carbide with uh, one carbon atom missing and I wanted to see whether the hydrogen binds at all strongly to the carbon vacancy. Oddly enough it doesn't, it prefers to be, these are not very good NEB calculations, I need to improve my technique but the fact is that the hydrogen does not bind to the vacant site, in fact it prefers uh, to sit in its own octahedral sites. Thank you very much.